Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're gonna to be talking about microscopy and we'll also be talking about staining techniques. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're gonna to be talking about microscopy. As the name implies, microbiology is the study of things that are very, very small, and most of the things that we study and observe require us to use microscopes. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Now, it turns out that broadly, there are two major types of microscopy that are used in microbiology to study living things. The first one is the one you're probably most familiar, familiar with. That's light microscopy. That's the use of light and glass lenses in order to magnify and observe microscopic organisms. On the other hand, we have one that you may be less familiar with, and that is electron microscopy. Now, electron microscopy is much more powerful. Electron microscopy can let us see, for example, internal cellular structures like the plasma membrane and the mitochondria and things like that. But there are pros and cons to both light and electron microscopy. So let's start by talking about light microscopy. Light microscopy, as I said, is likely the one you're most familiar with. If you've ever used a microscope in your biology lab or any other type of lab, you most likely use light microscopy. Now, light microscopy uses photons of light and then the bending of that light through a series of mirrors and glass objective lenses in order to magnify the sample. Now, the pros to light microscopy are this. Light microscopy, for example, or for starters, can be used with living specimens. So you don't have to kill the specimen or do anything with it. You can study live, moving, fully functioning uh, specimens uh, under using light microscopy. Another advantage to light microscopy is it's relatively simple in how to use it, and it's also relatively inexpensive. So those working together uh, mean that's why the majority of your lab experiences in which you've used microscopes, you use light microscopy. I would venture to say all of your laboratory experiences have used light microscopy. But what's the downside to light microscopy? Well, Light microscopy has a very narrow, useful range. It turns out with light microscopy, using photons and glass and mirrors, you can really only get clear images of things with up to about a thousand X magnification. So you can only magnify things to be about a thousand times larger than they actually are. Which, if you're studying, micro, uh, studying bacteria, for example, you can pretty much see almost any kind of bacteria under a light microscope but you won't ever be able to see any of the internal structures and you won't be able to study things that are as small as viruses. So if we're going to study things that are smaller than bacterial cells, or we wanna see what's going on inside of cells, we need to use electron microscopy. So the advantage to using electron microscopy, electron microscopy is going to use a beam of electrons to illuminate the sample. In fact, electron microscopy is actually a lot more similar to an X-ray than it is to light microscopy. Now, while electron microscopy is a lot more powerful, you can, you can magnify your specimens up to about 100,000 times the size they originally are, which allows you to see internal structures, you can see inside the mitochondria, you can see inside the nucleus, you can see even the smallest viruses on the planet using electron microscopy. However, the downside to electron microscopy is this, all of the samples you study have to be dead. And the reason why is in order to do electron microscopy um, the right way, you have to use an elect. You have to coat them in an electron dense material. Quite often, gold particles are used um, in order to get proper images. So the samples usually have to be uh, intricately prepared. They have to be killed, and oftentimes they have to be what's called cryo sliced. They have to be sliced very thin in order to perform electron microscopy appropriately. The other downside to electron microscopy uh, is that it's expensive. Uh, it, it's expensive and it requires a large amount of expertise. So uh, you don't just have an electron microscopy in your lab and show up and go, oh, I'm doing microscopy. Uh, no, you have to be trained on how to do it. There, you have to, I mean, typically uh, it's very common for many institutes to have a person who, or, or people who are just the electron microscopist. That's what they do. They do all the electron microscopy for them. So it is an advanced skill, whereas light microscopy is not. Again, the advantage to electron microscopy is you can see in much more detail in much smaller objects. Uh, there are two major varieties of electron microscopy. You've got your, your transmission electron microscopy, uh, 
Transmission electron microscopy is great for seeing internal structures. You slice them very thin. You can see some micrographs here where you can see inside of the cells. Uh, and then you've got your scanning or SEM scanning uh, electron microscopes. Uh, these are ones that you can see the external portions uh, of the sample. Uh, so you can see uh, a couple of samples here uh, in these electron micrographs where you can see very intricate details of the outside. It almost gives it like a three dimensional appearance. So both uh, light and electron microscopy have their pros and cons. Given that the majority of you who are watching this video will be encountering the world of microbiology using light microscopy, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about the nature of light microscopy and how it works, or we'll, we'll kind of have the rest of the conversation mainly focusing on light microscopy. Regardless of the type of microscopy you're using, any good microscope technique should have three key characteristics that are essential for doing good microscopy. The first thing, the first characteristic of good microscopy is magnification. Your technique should magnify the sample. If you're not magnifying the sample, then what are you even doing, right? So we need something that's going to make the sample larger so that we can see it because these are things that we can't see with our naked eye. So magnification is the first key characteristic. But magnification alone is useless because if you're looking at something that's really big but also really blurry, is it really helping you? That next feature of good microscopy is what we call resolution. Resolution is the ability to distinguish between two nearby objects and view them as being separate objects. In other words, it's how clear your image is. One thing that we have to do with light microscopy is we have to compensate for the fact that light bends as it moves through different mediums. So if you look at a normal light micro, if you know, if you understand what's happening with a normal uh, during a normal light microscopy experiment, it looks like this. Light is going to come from the light source. It will then pass through the sample, which is typically on glass. So light is going to go out of the light source through air. Then as it goes into the glass, it's going to bend, okay, because it's going through a different medium. Okay, this is what we call refraction. Then it's going to go back through the air, refract again, and then go back through the glass of the objective and bend yet again. And every time light gets bent, you lose a little bit of the clarity. Some of the light scatters. So quite commonly, once we get above about 400x magnification, we have to start using what we call immersion oil. Once you get somewhere between 40, 400 and 630 times magnification, immersion oil becomes required. So this is what we call oil microscopy, or we use an oil immersion objective in order to study the sample. And here's how the oil helps. The oil that we put on the sample, the oil that we use during oil immersion microscopy has the same refractive index as glass or very close to it. So here's what the path of light looks like when we're using oil immersion. Light leaves the light source. It passes through the glass that the sample is contained on and it bends slightly. But then as it leaves the glass, it goes into the oil and doesn't bend anymore because the oil has the same refractive properties or nearly the same refractive properties as glass. It then goes straight through the oil and then doesn't bend again as it enters the glass of the objective. The end result is a much clearer image. In other words, oil is used to improve resolution at much higher magnification. So oil immersion allows us to get much, much more magnification of our light microscopy. Understand though that we are still capped, whether we're using oil or not, at about a thousand fold total magnification. Above that, we're gonna lose pretty much all of our resolution and we have to turn to electron microscopy. The third key characteristic of good microscopy is contrast. Understand that when we're looking at microbes, although some microbes do have an actual color to them, most cells are pretty much transparent and incredibly small. So if you have a transparent sample on a transparent slide with bright light passing through it, it becomes incredibly hard to see them. In order to get good contrast, contrast is the ability to distinguish your sample from the background. So in order to get good contrast with our samples, quite often in light microscopy, we turn to the use of stains. So staining techniques are techniques used to provide contrast. Now there are two broad classes of stains. Uh, with respect to how they stain the sample. The first is what we call a positive stain. A positive stain accomplishes contrast by staining the particular specimen. So if we're looking at this sample here, you can see that it's the bacteria that have been stained while the background remains transparent. 
Conversely, a negative stain stains the background, but not the specimen. In a sense, uh, the, the background becomes colored while the sample remains transparent. Now, there's a good reason why in certain conditions we would like to use negative staining techniques. Quite often, we use negative and positive staining techniques at the same time. Let's look at this particular example here. This example here uses is a specimen known as Cryptococcus. Now, Cryptococcus is a species of fungi, actually. Now, the actual cell itself is incredibly small. It's this little tiny dot in the middle. But look what happens when we apply the negative stain to the background beyond it. Now, doesn't the entire cell look much bigger? And the answer is yes. And that's because Cryptococcus has what we call a capsule around it, a big sort of gelatinous extracellular matrix that surrounds it. You can only observe that that does not stain with a positive stain. So if we were looking for cryptococcus on a microscope, we would see these little tiny dots if we just used a positive stain. If we use a, by using the negative stain, we can see the background stain and we can see that whole capsule that now surrounds it. And it looks much different. It gives us a much better image as a result of it. Now, that being said, staining techniques can be both positive or they can be positive or negative. The other thing we consider a stain is whether it's a simple stain or a differential stain. Now understand that a simple stain can be both can be positive and it can be simple and negative. They're not mutually exclusive of each other. Usually we refer to them both ways. This is a simple positive stain, for example. Simple stains are just that, simple. It's typically a single dye, uh, something like crystal violet or saffron and red or methylene blue. When you have a simple stain, whatever you're staining is gonna be the same color. So in this case, this is a positive stain and you can see that is a positive simple stain. No matter what type of bacteria or microbes that you're, that you're staining, they're all gonna be that color, that one single color, okay? You can't tell any difference between them. You can see their shape, you can see their relative size, and that's it, okay? Differential stains, just like when we talked about differential media in a previous video, differential stains are going to tell us that, there's, that there could reveal differences between the different types of microbes that are growing in this particular culture. The classic example of a differential stain is what we call gram stain. So gram staining is a differential technique and most differential stains require a technique. You have to apply multiple stains and attempt to remove them or replace them. Gram staining works like this. First, you take your sample and you heat fix it. In other words, you kill it. Then you apply crystal violet. Crystal violet is a purple stain and everything on that slide is gonna be purple. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna add a mordant called iodine and iodine is gonna to help to lock the crystal violet into typically the cell wall of the microbes. Then we're gonna to attempt to remove that by rinsing it with a decolorizer. Quite often this is acetone um, or a type of alcohol that is used to remove the crystal violet. You rinse it briefly, five to 10 seconds, and then you hit it again with a counter stain. Now the reason for the counter stain is this. If a sample retains the crystal violet, even after you've hit it with the decolorizer, under the microscope, that stain will appear purple. That purple color is what we call a positive gram reaction. But if the sample has a negative gram reaction, after you've decolorized it, the crystal violet will be gone, and those particular specimens would be transparent again. So we use a counter stain of a different color. Typically, we use what's called saffron and red. And then after we apply the saffron in red, we rinse it with water. Now, if we look under a microscope, those things that have a positive gram reaction should be stained still with that crystal violet, okay? Those things that have a negative gram reaction or are gram negative, those are actually going to be red in color because they would have lost the crystal violet stain after the decolorization step and then added the red stain when we applied the counter stain. Now, when this was first studied, when this was first discovered by Hans Christian Graham, he had no idea what the difference between the bacteria he was staining was. He just knew that if he took bacteria and he stained them using this technique, about half the things he studied would be purple, which we would refer to as gram positive. Half the things he studied would be red, which we would now refer to as gram negative. What we now know is the difference has to do with the structure of the cellular envelope. Gram positive bacteria have a single super thick cell wall made out of peptidoglycan and a single 
biological cell membrane, basically cell single cell membrane. Gram negative bacteria have a single cell wall, but that cell wall is incredibly thin and it's sandwiched between two biological membranes, two cell membranes, an inner and an outer membrane. The reason why they don't retain the crystal violet after decolorization is it turns out that the crystal violet actually attaches primarily to the peptidoglycan since the cell wall made of peptidoglycan and gram negative cell walls is very, very low. It's very thin. It doesn't retain it very well. It loses the stain and then it counter stains red when we use the saffron and red to follow it up. Now, again, that wasn't known initially when it was discovered, but it's the classic example of, of what we would call a differential positive staining technique. Remember, it's still considered a positive staining technique because it stains the specimen and not the background. Unfortunately, we also refer to the result of it as being gram positive or gram negative. So regardless, I mean, to clarify, if a sample is gram positive or a sample is gram negative, it's still positively stained when we describe it as a technique. I know that can be confusing, but sometimes that happens in science. We kind of overlap with our terms. I'm just teaching it. I didn't get to decide on it. So regardless of which staining technique you use, whether it's a positive stain or a negative stain, whether it's a simple stain or differential stain, uh, again, the main reason uh, for staining techniques and light microscopy is to, to accomplish that third important characteristic of microscopy, contrast. So the big three things you need from any good micro microscopy technique, whether it's light microscopy or electron microscopy, you need good magnification, you need good resolution, and you need to have good contrast in order to be able to distinguish your sample from the background. Thanks for tuning in today. Today we talked a lot about microscopy. We talked about the difference between light and electron microscopy, as well as the key characteristics of any good microscopic experiment, proper magnification, good resolution, and excellent contrast. They're all needed. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I really look forward to seeing you guys next time.